The government doesn't want them in expensive hotels. Many local people don't want them in their town. So where should we put the tens of thousands of asylum seekers already here in the country? Well, one proposed site is here, in the seaside town of Bexhill on the East Sussex coast, though many locals are against it. The audience here also want to talk about sewage in our rivers and seas and why they still don't know who should get their vote at the next election. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel from the government, Helen Waitley is a health minister with special responsibility for social care. It's her second stint in the role, having served in that position during the COVID pandemic. From Labour, Thangham Debonair is shadow leader of the House of Commons. The MP for Bristol West, who's also a trained classical cellist, was previously shadow for Brexit and then housing, and has also written two books about domestic violence. Retired vicar does the Reverend Richard Coles' career no justice. Leaving his duties as Anglican priest last year has given him more time for his writing, broadcasting, being chancellor at Northampton University and a fellow at King's College London. Oh, and he was once half of the 80s duo, the Communards. From former Communard to self-styled luxury communist, Ash Sarkar is a contributing editor at the left-wing Novara Media website. She's writing a book about the culture wars and we might find out what luxury communism is later on. And the award-winning broadcaster and journalist Nick Ferrari hosts The Breakfast Show on the radio station LBC. He also writes a weekly column for The Sunday Express. Welcome to our panel. Welcome to our audience here at Bexhill on Sea. You are, as always, on Question Time, a broad reflection of the electoral map of the country. And, of course, welcome to you at home. As ever, we're on social media and we are also on a podcast on BBC Sounds after the programme. So, let's take our first question, shall we? Which is from Robin Harris. Is the Archbishop of Canterbury right when he says the Illegal Migration Bill is morally unacceptable and politically impractical? Impractical. Well, given that you're referring to the Archbishop of County there, Robin, I thought I might come to you, <laughs> Richard, first, as a former man of the cloth. Well, this is a line that falls in frequently from my lips, but I agree with the Archbishop of Canterbury, as a matter of fact. I think the bill is politically unworkable, I think it is legally doubtful, and I think it is morally indefensible. I think it's morally indefensible because I think it effectively cuts off routes for asylum seekers, genuine asylum seekers, to find asylum in this country. I think by... And, and I think the real problem here, you know, everybody says we must do absolutely everything we can to stop uh, the terrible journeys on small boats landing on this coast on which I live. And that's absolutely right. But I think the way to do that is to go after people traffickers. And it's not to penalise the people who are seeking to escape from unimaginably tough circumstances in all sorts of places around the world to come here. Now, if there were safe and legal routes for them to do that adequately, that would be fine, but there simply aren't. And to make them, if they arrive illegally, therefore inadmissible as asylum claimants, seems to me to be the morally indefensible part of it. We owe them that. I think it demeans us we don't offer that. And also, it's legally very dodgy. It seems to me to be not consistent with our commitment under the European Convention on Human Rights. So I'm with Justin Welby, I think, on this one. OK. Well, I'm going to disagree with Reverend Richard. I'm also going to disagree with the Archbishop on this. Actually, the thing that I think is morally wrong is the status quo. The thing that I think is morally wrong is thousands of people risking their lives and paying people smugglers to come to the UK, making not only putting their own lives at risk and money into organised crime, but also making it harder for us to do what we really want to do, which is offer asylum to people who really needed. So what we need to do is stop that route. We've got to stop the boats coming here. We've got to make that model for the people smugglers no longer be economically viable. Stop the pull here. So we've got to do this 
to stop the boats. And then that means that we can do the thing that we really want to do, and we already do as a nation, we should be proud of. We've already welcomed half a million people to come here to seek asylum over the last, uh, since 2015. So we do that as a nation. That's what we want to be able to do in a compassionate way. Helen, we've we've got to stop the boats in order to be able to do that. But we've made it harder, Helen. We've made it harder. We take, I think, 1% of um, the refugees who are in the world looking for asylum. Other countries do much, much better than we do. 0.2% of the population of this country um, are refugees or asylum seekers. We're not talking big numbers here. So why do we make it so much more difficult? Why are we making people unable to even apply for asylum if they arrive by that route when there is no other safe and appropriate and adequate route for them to do it? We make it harder, not easier. Well, actually, what I, I think half a million people coming here since 2015 is a large number. The other thing which, which we're part of is a UN scheme, and the UN finds people who are most vulnerable and, uh, and, 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 and helps us provide asylum to those people. And actually, in the world, I mean, the we have... The UN has told the BBC we that have, at the moment the UK is only, only taking people from Afghanistan. We have the fourth so highest numbers... Else. Um, well, through the schemes of the UN, we have the fourth highest number of any country in the world in the number of people that we take through that scheme. So I would say, and if you look what we did for Ukrainians, people opening up their homes to welcome Ukrainians, I would say we really are a generous country on, uh, on offering asylum. But at the moment, one of the problems with the traffic and small boats is people who can afford to pay those people smugglers and, you know, very sadly, giving that money to the people smugglers. That's an awful thing and risking their lives. That's the way that they're coming here. That is what we've got to stop. And I just think it is morally wrong to allow that to continue. I can tell you all want to come in. I'm just going to go to the audience and I'll come to you. The man at the very back. Thank you. Um, if the resettlement schemes are the only way to legally um, apply for asylum from outside of the UK, and the Home Office admitted there's no other way um, to apply from outside of the UK, then you're automatically criminalising anyone from anywhere else in the world um, by forcing them to try and come across illegally because there's no other way for them to get asylum. OK. I'm going to come back to you, Helen Austin. We're going to get round to a bit more of the audience. Yes, there's a woman... Yes, you had your hand up there. Yes. Hi there. Um, yeah, I was just about to say the rhetoric is so... just so awful. I remember, you know this country being somewhere where we welcomed our immigra immigrants, we welcomed them whatever way they came in, and, you know, there's no Sudanese safe route, and look what's going on over there, you know, what are the future plans? It's not just about stopping the boats. I'm so bored of listening to that rhetoric. But actually, what are we going to do when immigration does happen and people do come across? Do you know what they're going to do? They're going to go underground. And that's really sad. Those, those people aren't going to get the help that they need and become part of our inclusive society. So, yeah, I, I think you need a rethink on this one. Stopping the boats isn't working. All right, the man next to you. I, uh, I, I agree with Helen. Um, the status quo has got to be evened out. Uh, it is morally wrong what the government are trying to do. However, it's morally wrong that people can travel through several countries and then pay criminals to get a lift across the channel. OK, thank you. I agree with the Archbishop of Canterbury when he says it's morally unacceptable and politically impractical, this bill. And I also agree that it is completely dangerous and wrong for people to be forced and feel forced to put themselves in the hands of very dangerous routes and criminal gangs who are exploiting them and a system that isn't working. What is also unacceptable is the massive backlog of asylum claims that there is in this country. When I first became an MP in 2015, I used to be able to tell people who came to this country to seek asylum um, that I would be able to get an answer from the Home Office within 24 hours as to where in the process they were and that they would get a decision within six months. That's gone. We have people who are in hotels or barges or wherever at the expense of the British taxpayer, costing nearly £6 million every single day, not because of the boats, but because of the backlogs. And this bill will just make that backlog even bigger because we will no longer be able... Won't, if people arrive from Khartoum or from, from, the, from Sudan or from Ukraine if they don't have their documents, or Afghanistan if they haven't been able to find a safe and legal route to, to, to this country. If they're coming to join a relative here and they don't have the right documents, they will be deemed not only illegal now but forever, but we won't be able to send them back. 
So they will simply be stuck in limbo. Now, that's not good for anyone. Whatever side of the debate you're on, nobody wants people to have to cross this channel in, in small boats. It's dangerous and it's illegal so... and it's wrong. However, we have to have a better way of dealing with this crisis. Dealing with the backlog, tackling the criminal gangs, admitting that the Rwanda experiment has gone horribly wrong, because that's it's obviously not working and it's not deterring anybody, and dealing with the problem upstream by making safe and legal routes actually work. So, the, uh, I mean, the Labour <laughs> leader following the local election results has been making much play about how Labour is now a government in waiting. Yes. Should this illegal migration bill pass before the next general election, would Labour repeal it? I'm assuming they would, given well, your Well, we, we voted against it. We've tried to amend it. We oppose it so vehemently. Would, would you repeal we it? We will have, after 14 years of Tory governments, a whole list of things we'd like to undo. We will also have a whole long list of things that the people of this okay, country so you're not have asked committing, us to Just to be clear, you're I not committing to repealing it. As shadow leader of the House of Commons, it would be irresponsible for me, as a government minister in waiting, to make a promise about when we will be able to timetable each and every single thing that we want to undo. But we have to undo the part of that law which makes it unworkable for a future okay, Mo Farah to get to this country and actually okay. become a British citizen. And that's what we, where we would start. Ash. I want to talk a bit more about what this bill does. What this bill does is that it will treat anybody who comes here, but on a small boat, which includes people from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Libya, from Sudan, from Eritrea, it will treat all of those people blanketly as criminals. So people who have been raped, people who have been tortured, people who are fleeing persecution. What the bill also does is that it removes protections for pregnant women. The current limit in place is that they can only be detained for 72 hours. It will remove those limits. So some of those victims of persecution and war and rape who are pregnant, who find themselves in this country at last, it should be a safe haven, could find themselves facing the prospect of giving birth in what is effectively a glorified camp or prison. And that's not who we are as a country. That's not the best we can do for people who are fleeing the Taliban or who are fleeing Syrian prisons or who are fleeing persecution in Iran. And that's why I object so strongly when you, when, when you use these words like generosity to talk about things like having a glorified prison ship or refurbishing a prison just around the corner from here in order to detain people who are fleeing some of the most unimaginable circumstances possible. No government does that because they think it's morally good. No government does that because they think it's particularly efficient or effective. You're doing it because you've committed yourself to this nastiness Olympics because you want a pat on the back from the Daily Mail. And the human no. cost of no. that is obscene. No, it's not true. It's not true. Okay. Okay. I'm going to give you a good chance to respond. I'm just going to, going to get around. And, and, and what you're referring to, Ash, in terms of the uh, former prisoner here is, is called North Eye. I think a lot of you will be familiar with which, which is a... A uh, former prison, have I got that right? Which should, we, is, the intention is it will house up to 1,200 uh, men. Um, and there's been a considerable degree of local protest, some support, but local protest against it, Nick. Right, Robin's initial question was about the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm a huge admirer of the Archbishop of Canterbury, but on this one he's actually got it wrong. He also talks about how it would tarnish the reputation of the United Kingdom. Respectfully, I think we still have a reputation of which we can be very proud. Over the last 20 years, we have quite rightly welcomed 7 million people to this country. This year, it looks as around 85,000 individuals will try and cross the Channel. Net migration into this country could be somewhere in the region of 500 thousand people, many of whom have paid vile people traffickers to get here. Yeah, but the if vast that is majority not, of that, Nick, is legal it, migration. Absolutely. If that, if that is not a case where we need to be morally responsible, then I don't know what is. And the reality is that a show like this comes into town, we meet you great people, and then you are left with the situation of what I think Ash has already mentioned, which is the North Eye camp up the road, which I read in the local newspaper is riddled with asbestos, was nearly burnt to the ground and would pose a real problem. This cannot be. Where else are you going to house these people? This will be visited on people here. It will be visited on people in Weymouth, in Ramsgate and everywhere else until the Home Office, absolutely right, sorts itself out. If you go to France, your application is processed average six months. Yeah. If you go to Italy, your application is processed roughly eight, eight months. If you come to the United Kingdom, it's 18 months, and that is what the government has to stop, because that's what will address the numbers. <laughs> 
Let's some more for the audience, and now I'll come to you, Helen. Now, we have some... Yes, there's a man with his hand up there in a sort of grey-green top. I can't really see very clearly. Yes, with the glasses. The, the bit I don't understand is that you're pledged to stop the boats. How do your pr proposals actually stop boats leaving French beaches? How do, they, how do you do stop that? OK, we'll come to you. And, yes, a man further back with the glasses there. Yes. Um, this is going to be another failed project, basically, because it's not targeting the, the source of the problem. It's targeting the victims. It's going to fail and things will continue. I, I agree that there needs to be collaboration with other partners, European partners, to deal and hum, um, morally accepted, through morally acceptable ways um, sort the problem and, it, and help others to, to come here, those who are fleeing persecutions in other countries. OK. The woman over there at the back. Yes, you've got a microphone hanging over there, yes. Oh. Um, this government is demonising people. Asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, they are fleeing persecution, they're fleeing war. All they want is the same as the rest of us. They want to be able to live their lives safely, bring up their families, and the government is using them as a smokescreen to distract people from the real problems in this country. I've been to a lot of the countries that migrants are fleeing from. I've been to places like Syria and Iran, and I've talked to people. They are just ordinary, decent people like us. One of my strongest memories from Syria is when I went before the Civil War and we went on a family holiday. My daughter at the time was about two years old. And I remember sitting outside a shop, drinking tea with a, the shop owner, and he had a little girl the same age. And the two of them, they couldn't speak a word of each other's languages, and they were sharing a colouring book and they were looking at each other. And he looked at me and my partner and said, look at them, I wish politicians could see this. And he was a dad. He wanted his little girl to grow up and have a safe life. It's all that all of us want. Now, see, it's, it's, it's interesting hearing your views. I mean, most of the views, I mean, I've picked you at random, obviously, who you've got your hand up, are, are very much against what the government is proposing. But I, I know from obviously doing a bit of research about the local mm. area, plus there's a bit of a protest that went on outside earlier, that there's a, a fair degree of opposition to the idea of, of housing asylum seekers here. I'd be interested to hear from any, anyone who's got, a, who's got something to say about that. Just in the interest of balance here. Yes, are you at the back, you're putting your hands up. Yes, the woman there. Um, I live on the North High Estate, four doors away from the gates. And for us residents, it is a big concern because we will have 1,200 men, only men, roaming around the estate and further into Little Common and Bexhill until 11 p.m. at night. We have very young, well, the youngest uh, child is a baby. We have toddlers, we have sc uh, primary school children, secondary school children, um, young girls, young boys on the estate. And we are very concerned about their, their safety. Further down the road, we have five care homes, and um, we, like, like I said, we, we will just be okay. constantly worried what will happen to our children. All right, and the man next to you. Uh, yeah, so I'm a foster carer who also lives next to Bridget. And how am I supposed to explain to the local authority that I'm safe to keep a child with me with 1,200 random strange foreign men living opposite me? Exactly right. Helen, let's come back to you, because uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, there's been Very some much. support uh, for your policy, uh, a lot of criticism, and then there's this big local issue, oh. which is an issue here, uh, this North Eye prison, but obviously we know, know that there are suggestions for uh, ex-army bases and what have you around other areas. I mean, three local Tory areas and three local MPs mm. there are saying, thank you, Anna, I want it. Mm. I mean, I think, I think you know, some of the conversation we've had this evening really you know, encapsulates the whole problem of wanting to be able to welcome individuals here uh, seeking asylum, seeking a safe place to live because they've come from somewhere where it's extremely dangerous and you know, a great contribution that they will then make to our society and, and communities. But then here on the doorstep, uh, I absolutely know about the unhappiness about the prospect of the North Eye uh, camp to house asylum seekers as we try and move people out of hotels into more suitable accommodation. Because, as Sangan mentioned, we know how expensive hotel From accommodation hotels and is. And so we know that people continuing to live in hotels 
isn't the right thing to do. Very expensive. Also, preventing local towns, for instance, using their hotels for tourism or for the local economy. Um, so something has to change. I know for, for residents here, and I, I spoke to Hugh Merriman, your Member of Parliament, about this earlier today. I know he's a very strong voice for you in government. I assure you um, <laughs> on that. You hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You might have lost the room there, right. I well, think, OK, can I just say... Because I sound like a broken record, I say that almost every week. But the, question, the question I'm ordered reflects yeah. the broad electoral map of the country We're in England. So, so more people in this audience voted Conservative uh, at the last election than for any other single party. So the fact that you're getting that loud ripple mm. of laughter there is not a reflection that you're, this is full of Labour supporters, mm. not at all. Yeah. I just wonder what you make of that. Well, I know it's how strongly people feel about not wanting to have asylum um, seekers accommodated on the edge of the town and I know that but we also know uh, as Sangan as you said yourself and give me a moment because there are a lot of points I think it makes sense for me to, to pick up that we do have to find somewhere else for asylum seekers if, you can say, process them we Helen have, exactly we right. have the same that a similar problem is happening in other countries in Europe where the numbers have gone <laughs> up where, no. yes where they asylum seekers are being accommodated in Hotels. I will come to the processing for just a moment. Right. So, Ash, you talked about um, uh, you know, the dangers for people in the countries they're fleeing from. Do you have to remember that most people coming here in small boats are coming from France? Now, I don't know about you, I have been to the camp in Calais and spoken to people who are planning to come here. And I spoke to them about why they were coming here and why weren't they, for instance, applying for asylum in France. Some of them didn't want to because they didn't reckon they would get asylum and they wanted to come here. Some just really, really wanted to come to the UK. But they so, are coming from a safe so, country. So, so just to, and if just they to, just have to, a claim for asylum, they could it, make that claim it's, it's, there. It's really useful. So it's really, it's really, it's really, really, no, I just want hey, to... Let, let, let Helen out, just because there's there a lot of... Things that came up. Okay, to the question about safe routes. Well, there are three ways that you can come to uh, the UK at the moment through safe routes. We have our settlement schemes, for instance, that we've uh, for, for people coming from Afghanistan, uh, from from Hong Kong, for instance. Of course, we had the fantastic uh, Ukrainian scheme. Um, there's family reunion scheme, and there's a the UN scheme that I mentioned a moment ago. Then to point about processing. Yes, it's really, really important. Yes, we have too many people. It's we have to built up too large a backlog because we haven't managed to expand the capacity in the home office no, process you've cut at the it. same rate that people you've have cut come over here in small boats. Action has been, is being taken on that. For instance, we've doubled the number of decision makers in the home office who can process these applications. We're improving the process if people are coming from a country where they're very likely to get asylum. For instance, they have a faster track process. And we've taken action, for instance, very specifically on people coming from Albania, which is a safe country. We've reached a deal with the Albanian government to support people quickly back to Albania, which I think picks up the, the final thing I really want to say about, you know, will this work? Uh, will it make a difference? Can we stop the boats? Well, I mean, actually, not this side of the election, because the Prime Minister's already said that. Well, what, so, so in overall, in the approach that we're taking to stop the boats, uh, including, and I know it's very controversial, um, that the plan uh, to deport people to Rwanda for their asylum claims to be processed How's that there. Going? Well, um, what we've seen with Albania is, is around a third of the people coming here in small boats were coming from Albania. Now that's fallen to about 2%. And what's happened is people from Albania know that actually they will be on a plane back to Albania if they come here. So they're no longer coming here because they know it's no longer a viable route to come to the UK. That's we've got, what we've got to do. We've got to stop the viable routes and then we can focus on the safe routes for people who are really bona fide uh, asylum seekers to be the welcoming country that we want to be. May I, may, may, may I jump in here? Just very okay, so I'm, I'm going to move on, take another question in a moment. Um, so, one, on the issue of why don't they stay in France. Well, actually, most asylum seekers do stay in other countries, like France, like Germany, like Italy. And the ones that want to come here, very often it's because they've got family or friends here. Very often it's because they already speak the language. And if your point is that refugees should always stay in their first safe country, we would never take anyone because we're an island. Actually all right? That's, <laughs> so it, it's not a point. fair or efficient system. The other point that I would like to make is that this idea that what you do is you create things, you know, you make conditions as nasty as possible and then you provide safe alternative routes. 
That's the opposite way around. What you've done is then you're treating everybody like a criminal. You're forcing refugees in some really horrible situations. Then we go, OK, well, at some later date, we'll sort it out. No, you should establish the safe and legal routes first, because there are people who are stuck in limbo. There are people who are really afraid that they're going to be detained in a prison for God knows how long, and they've just fled a country where they were going to be persecuted I'm, I'm and really, tortured in one. It sounds so kind, but, but we, have, we, we have to, on the one hand, Yes, have safe routes here, but we just cannot keep going with the status quo. Because but no, no, but look, you're, you're in charge. You're, you're, okay. you're, you're in, you're in, you're in charge of the status quo. You cut change. the budgets. You create an expensive problem, and now you're so, saying. So, so it is a relatively recent phenomenon. People coming here in small boats. And who's so been in government thing, recently? It's a new you. Business model that has been developed. So people coming here in okay. small boats. Because you cut off the safe legal that's routes. What we have to because stop. Because you cut off so the safe legal routes. That's the that's a fact. We haven't cut off the safe. Yes, you have. How is someone from Eritrea supposed to get here? Almost How half a million people to get here? have had the opportunity okay. to come here for asylum I'm, in I'm, the last few years. Okay. That's not cutting off the safe th anymore. This is illuminating, but I've got a hell of a lot of people out there <laughs> who want to take their hands up. Let's take two more points, then I must move on, because otherwise I won't do justice to your other question. Yes, a woman here in the front in the, in the snazzy glasses. Two <laughs> points, really. One, what has happened to all the money that we give to France to stop the boats from coming in the first place? And secondly, specifically to do with North Eye, Somebody said to me once that Eastbourne was full of old people and their parents live in Bex Hill. <laughs> so, <laughs> an, an, in, an influx of 120,000 young men will completely alter the demographics of Bex Hill. 1,200. 1,000, yes, yes, yes 1,200 young men. OK. So what do they do here? And, and the, the man there. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the justifications that's been given is, is it's to free up hotel accommodation. Now, looking at the numbers, there are, North Island's going to take 1,200 people, but I think the numbers last year was 48,000 in total coming over. So North Island's full within two weeks. How are they going to address the problem for the other 50 weeks of the year? Um, doing the backlog. Yeah. Just a minute or Just two. Quick. So I'm never I mean, going to get One of on. the very important things is that we that is for people. Uh, who are already here and we have to, as I've mentioned, we have to be processing and we are working on processing their claims more quickly. But obviously that's being that's added to... very week, important. The question about, uh, yes, about France, we're, for instance, I'm working with France on increasing the patrols of beaches to, to stop the small boats leaving and working with France on their plans for a detention centre. So there's a couple okay. of things that the funding is going in. But clearly, I mean, as, you, as, as the gentleman over there was just saying about the numbers, that's one reason why not only do we need to process quickly, more quickly as we as, as we are working on, but also we have got to stop the flow of new arrivals okay, here. That's you've made that point. I'm going to move on, because there's other questions you wanted to discuss tonight. Uh, I, before I do, I just want to say that next week we're in Fort William, lovely Fort William in the Western Highlands, and the week after that, Question Time is in Gravesend in Kent. So if you'd like to come to either of those programmes, go to the Question Time website, the address is here, and uh, you can see directly how to apply, and we would love to see you. So Fort William and then Gravesend. OK, our next question is from Julie Kay. Why are water companies such as Southern Water allowed to disperse raw sewage into the sea, causing considerable environmental damage? So, Julie, you mentioned Southern Water, which is a local water yeah. company. It's an issue with water companies all around the United Kingdom, I, I might say. Um, Thangham. Well, I think we have to look at the government. They have been in power for 13 years. This is not a new problem. They've had plenty of opportunities to change the way that they treat the water companies, the legislation and the regulations that surround them. So what they would, they, the would Labour do? Let's hear, because I, I, it, it's a given, in a way, that you're going to be very critical of the government, and that's entirely well, we fair came enough. Up that's with your a position. Set, we came up so with what, a set what, of proposals. What, what are your proposals. We have a bill which we put before Parliament only a few weeks ago, and the government decided that they, they weren't having any of it. They basically gutted it in the motion and then voted for their gutted version of our so, bill. So what what we mean? want to do is we want to make sure that chief executives are accountable, that they are properly held to, to account. And how, that there how are would strict you do that? Well, you, you can have a system whereby um, they, they can be held legally accountable and that, that it can be part of how they are financially treated. We also need rules that are actually made to stick. We need enforcement. And this indicates a bigger problem, which relates, in a way, to the previous question. The government is failing to get the basics right. If they can't get the regulation of water companies or of asylum system on all the basics of what make up our country, why are they, why are they 
they even still here? Because they don't seem to even want to sort this situation out. It's been a problem for some years now. They have been warned. I don't want to hear that it's because of, because of the COVID. This has been around for a while now. So, and water companies have been allowed, as, as the companies that have been structured in the way that they have, they've been allowed to get away with it for too long. And it's about time the government took charge of this situation. They could pick up our bill tomorrow <laughs> if they want to. Well, and they've chosen you, not you, to. You say pick up the bill. And also, I will, I will come to Helen on this. So, a parliamentary committee came up with a figure of £50 billion over a number of decades to rebuild our Victorian sewage system in such a way as to stop these outflows of untreated sewage altogether. Is that, is that realistically something well, the that the water company, could pay The for? water companies are private companies. They're the ones who are responsible for it. That's what I'm talking about, accountability of chief so executives. expect them to find that I money? I expect All them to money. take care of our water supplies. They charge us for the water. Okay. They are supposed to provide us with right. a service. What are they doing? I, I can solve this at a stroke, and let me tell you how we do it. The water company bosses are paid an average of around £1 million a year. Between the 22 or 23 of them, they bank £25 million. The profits that they make are eye-watering. Mm -hmm. The fines that are levied by the government are almost built into the business model. They don't actually care because they're making so much money. Meanwhile, people in Bexhill and Eastbourne are out there swimming in a word I won't even use and you can't water your hydrangeas. This is the way we solve it and it's very simple. When the government wants to, they can bring in a law overnight, like the Public Order Act, which saw six people with a load of banners and some rubber bands arrested and thrown in jail. This is the law that needs to come in. Any chief executive who continually allows his or her company to put raw sewage into the water, let's get this law enacted straight away, will go to jail for five years for corporate... <laughs> Because, because, and one of my sons suffered from this, you can get Viles disease, fortunately he lived, which is a killer, and they are playing with people's lives by putting sewage in the water, put them behind bars, it'll be solved overnight. OK. Well, let's, uh, let's just get a sense of what we're talking about. I just want to show you a picture, uh, it's, it, it may be known to quite a few of you, this is a picture of uh, Newquay in Cornwall in 2021. And we'll just see that there. And it gives you some idea of, of what sewage going into the sea looks like. And, of course, here at Bexhill, uh, as you know, I don't need to tell you this, uh, the beach was, was shut uh, for a number of days last summer, two consecutive days in August. You couldn't go in the sea because there was an outflow of sewage. Let's hear from some of you. The woman here in the... In, yes, you in the orange. Yes. Hi, I live in Eastbourne and our water has recently been downgraded from outstanding to sufficient. This is going to impact our health and also, very importantly, our tourism. Our Conservative MP has recently suggested that it is to do with um, inefficient um, rogue plumbers and builders not connecting pipes correctly. Well, I've not heard that before. <laughs> uh, the, the man in the check shirt with the glasses in, right in the middle of the audience, yes. Hang on, let's wait to get the microphone to you. There you go, now we can yeah, hear you. Uh, basically, since the water companies have been privatised, it's got worse, hasn't it? Mm. Let's, let's be completely honest. Yeah, they don't fix the, uh, the leaks. They don't, you know, fix the sewage. Why don't, we, why don't any of the political parties talk about nationalising these utilities? <laughs> yeah. Yes, young man there in the, in the blue hoodie. How do you think it reflects on our nation that because I can remember this from a year or two ago, that about a week before we hosted the COP conference up in Scotland, the government voted to continue pumping sewage into the sea. Yeah. Right. Helen, what about Nick's idea? Bung him in jail. That's what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got some votes there. You've just what? reclaimed Bex Hill. You don't have to say thank you, Helen, don't worry. <laughs> I just... Usually these things just aren't as simple as that. Well, it was the Public Order Act. And usually, when something gets discussed in politics, well. it's because it's hard to fix. Um, I mean, this is uh, what the Environment so Secretary... Hang on, this is what the Environment Secretary said. Those who pledge to end the problem are either detached from reality or being definitively dishonest with the public. Do you share that view? Well, it's not easy. We have a huge infrastructure, as you mentioned, it's Victorian. It will take time and money 
to improve. So you can't just do it tomorrow. You can't just switch it off. Is but it not clearly, embarrassing to send from these people and go, let, my let, government let, can't improve your life let, in let, any let way? Let Helen that's, answer. That's not what I said. I mean, okay. that, that, no, no, that, no, that, 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 that's essentially what it is. No, You're saying that... Helen, let Helen... Sorry, let Helen answer, and of course I will come to you. I think there's no question. We're in agreement that government's view is water companies need to clean up their act, and we are making them. We are doing things that no other government has ever done before on this, the I mean, action that we're taking. Some campaigners now, are calling it a toothless plan. One of the reasons why we know plan. about this, nobody talks about this, we know about is because my government started monitoring the outflows from sewage companies oh, well, that makes before, it all right, then. but before nobody knew. It's just you not monitor, true. Before nobody knew. People did when they saw it on their beaches, Helen. Okay, so we started when they saw it on their beaches. We know had the European the Union regulations. What is going on? So monitoring and knowing the scale of the problem is important, and we're taking action. We have been taking action. In fact, already since 200, since 2015, 141 million pounds worth of fines have been paid by the water company. So they are already being penalised for when there, uh, there, there is pollution in the outflow. Yes. We have introduced tougher fines already, building on that in legislation. We are making the water companies yeah. invest to fix this problem. Over the next 25 years, they're going to be investing the order of £56 billion pounds to upgrade the water infrastructure. Do you, does the government take have a view? And money. We are determined to get them to fix it. We are taking really tough action really tough action but it does take time and does the government have a view when you say it will take time mm. when that might be well i just said i mean over the next 25 years 50 25 years, years. <laughs> well, it will improve, they 50, can't wait 25 years to go for a swim <laughs> she wants to go in tomorrow what's happened to this young lady the, the number i said was 20. 56 billion pounds over that period, it cannot be done simply overnight as simply okay. as that. These problems are hard to fix. All right. The woman here in the glasses. Oh, Hi, um, I was just wondering, does it not seem to be with all of these issues a little bit of the case that the Conservatives aren't investing in anything mm -hmm. and are actually investing in themselves? Cool. Um, <laughs> as a party, you're really benefiting financially, but nothing else is. Yeah. Yeah. Could you be a figure about 50 billion quid required in investment. Well, since privatisation, the water companies have raised 50 billion quid in debt. And where's that gone to? It's not gone on infrastructure. It's gone on maximising shareholder and stakeholder return. Yeah. 600 million quid between 2013 and 2017. And I think Nick's right. I think the penalties, the cost of those, but 90 million pound fine last year for Southern Water, um, I think that's priced right. into their yes. thinking. Yes. And that it's not seems to be about as likely as imagining that Piers Morgan didn't know that phone hacking was happening at Mirror Group <laughs> newspapers. <laughs> Do I have to say something? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that he says he didn't know about phone hacking. Oh, a pit just his, flew over head. Head. Well, <laughs> I just <laughs> say... <laughs> I'm just saying I have to say that, obviously. But can I just say, I, mean, I, live, um, I, live, uh, I live near East, between Eastbourne and Seaford, and I moved here because it's a very, very beautiful part of the world to live in, and we're extremely fortunate to live here, but I would not swim in the sea, and I would not go and paddle sure. in the stream that runs through my village, and it's a disgrace. Okay. And it's symptomatic of something greater. Privatising companies and I'm you know I think a privatized company that performs well that delivers to customers that does so with money for it that's fine by me I'm not ideological about it but all the time they seem to be um, our infrastructure is decaying our roads are undrivable our trains don't work our rivers are filthy our seas are filthy we need to rethink the way we fund this stuff okay let's hear a bit more from the audience there's a lot of hands up there's a man there in the glasses yes you sir yes you uh, right um yes well I live here in Bex Hill and um I go out fishing with the Hastings Angling Association. Two miles out to sea from the beach here, there's an outflow from the pipe, uh, which is raw sewage. Every time we go there, it's pumping it out. It's, it's being swept in here. People no longer swim. They used to, there used to be loads of swimmers along the seafront here. Now they're not. Well, well so, some do, because I bumped into three of them. Well, yeah, <laughs> Looking they're, they're, very they're, chilly as they just got out this Well, they are. They're the Bex Hill plungers. But, <laughs> but here's the point. Every, every single one of us who owns a house or property has to pay for fresh water and also for waste water. Now, so long as this sewage is still being pumped into our sea, I say we should be legally allowed mm. to withhold the money for the waste water. Privatised water companies paid out £1.4 billion in shareholder dividends last year. And 20% of your... And that's your... analysis by the Financial Times. And that's, that's, not that's analysis from the, from the FT. And 20% of your water bill is going towards shareholder profits and managing the debt for those privatised companies. Does that seem like a good use of your money? 
Do you feel you're getting good value for your money? No. Would you rather that money was going into fixing the infrastructure? Yes. While, they, while these companies remain in private hands, there's no incentive for them to do it. There is simply no incentive. So Southern Water is mostly owned by an Australian investment firm and it's partially owned by the American mega bank, JP Morgan. So your water bills are going towards making foreign corporations rich and because they are so fabulously rich, they can just eat up whatever fine the government decides to levy them with. And while it would be very satisfying to see some of these CEOs in jail, and I would love it personally, <laughs> what I fear is that the incentive hasn't gone away, which is you underinvest in the infrastructure, you let it crumble because, you know, you don't live there. You live in Manhattan or somewhere gorgeous. You don't have to worry about the sea in Bexhill. And instead, the incentive is to extract money from the system that could go towards fixing infrastructure, and you put it towards shareholder dividends. It makes financial sense at this point to bring this industry back into state control so all of the money can go towards fixing the problems. And, of course... The Tories don't really want to do that. They only nationalise things at the last possible minute, as they have with the Trans Pennine Express. But what confuses me is that Labour aren't committing to it either, when it would save so much public money. And it would mean that these problems would get fixed because you guys would be democratically accountable. You're not in Australia. You're not in Wall Street. You're right here where we can see you. Why not nationalise? I mean, the, the, the lady, Keir Starmer's manifesto has nationalised plenty of things. Why not that? We, we rejoiced today when the Tories finally worked out that actually taking the railways back into public okay, ownership but answer was question. important. In relation to water, we would have to pay the current owners. This is not a public company. I, I regretted that bitterly. I did not want the water companies to be sold off in the first place. But where we are at the moment is they do legally own to, a pr to private companies. They belong to private no, companies. No, but we know that. Ash's point is, why not nationalise them? Would Labour nationalise them? That's the question she's asking. Because the cost of repaying them is astronomical. And I don't want to spend taxpayers' money on that when I know that taxpayers are telling me that they want the money spending yeah, on our them. hospitals, yeah. on our schools, on our potholes, as we discussed earlier, I, and before the show, when we were chatting. I think it is really, really important that we're clear. Privatising the water companies would cost money. Bringing the railway... Sorry, nationalising the water companies would cost money. Bringing the railways back into national ownership is simply a matter of waiting for their tender to come up and then taking it back. Or, as the government has finally done today, saying, up with this, we will no longer put. I don't want to spend taxpayers' money okay. on, on water companies, on water company shareholders, yeah. when I could spend it on schools. And that's where I want your money to go, because I know that you work hard for it and there's not a lot of it going round at the moment. And All when right. we spend your money, we do so on your behalf. We can't just spend it on everything that we would like to. We need to spend it on the parties okay. you Okay, we have. hear you, we hear you. I'm going to take another question. Was that kind of... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, especially because we're, the sea is just there, isn't it? Or is it just there? I can't quite remember. You, want, you could talk about this all night. But you also want to talk about the following. So let's hear from Yvette Yates. Following the recent English local election results, have the Conservatives had a bit of a reality check? Right, so I'm just trying to work out where you are coming from with that question. So, can I ask you, how did you vote in 2019? Conservatives. You voted Conservative. And how, how did you vote at the local election? Well, we only had two candidates to choose from. One was an Independent and one was a Conservative. And I voted Independent because they were the only ones that made an effort to come round, even okay. though it was just a leaflet through the door. But, but at least they made an effort. The Conservatives didn't hear a thing from them. So you went from Conservative in 2019 to Independent last week. And, and do you, have you decided... I mean, your question is about will the local election results inform the general election results. Have you decided how you'll vote, presumably, next year? That's when we're expecting I have no it. idea at this stage. No, no idea. idea. OK. Um, Helen, have the Conservatives had a bit of a reality check? I mean, it's interesting... What, I mean, Yvette, you are, you know... A survey of one there, but that's what Yvette had to say. I mean, I, I know that the local election results were really hard for us as a party, and we lost many hard-working councillors. So I'm very sorry to hear that you didn't hear she from a Conservative councillor in your area. Um, the thing I know sitting here as a government minister is you know, recognising... and I, I, I know people hate me for saying this, but we have gone through difficult times, clearly, with the pandemic, with the war in Ukraine and inflation. Oh. I know you, you've grown... But at hard times, what we have to do is make sure we deliver 
for, for you, for the public. We know we've got to do the things that we've said we will do. That's why the Prime Minister set out those five very clear priorities. Why he said we're going to halve inflation, grow the economy, reduce the debt, cut waiting lists, stop the votes. Five really clear things which we want to make sure that we deliver for you so that you know we're a government that does what we say and we know we need to do that for you. I think before I come around the panel, I just want, want to try something. I mean, this Yvette's question is about uh, will how people vote in the local election, election determine how they vote in the general election? So can you put your hands up? Just everyone put their hands down for a second. Can you put your hand up if you intend to vote for the same party in the general election as you did in last week's local elections? OK, so a fair few, I think, yeah. is what we're seeing. If you put your hands down, who doesn't think that? Who thinks they might vote differently, or who just hasn't made up their mind yet? Whoa. Mm. Whoa. Whoa. Gosh, Whoa. a lot more. I think that's yeah. fair to say. And, and actually, I mean, I said earlier that, that, that more, part, more people in this audience voted Conservative than in any other single party. That they're not the majority, but than any other single party. But we have a lot of undecideds. Here tonight. We, we are very careful how we select our audience, as you know, because you've all been through it, to reflect the electoral map of, of the country. But a lot of undecided here tonight. Um, Thangham. Well, the question was, have they had a reality check? I don't know. It doesn't sound like it to me. But they <laughs> should have done. They should have done, because before the local elections, they were putting out figures of we, we might lose 1,000 seats in a sort of expectation management style. Well, they managed to keep that pledge. In fact, they managed to exceed it. I believe they lost 1,060-odd seats. Now, that's from a very low watermark of the elections of the same seats in 2019, which were so bad for them then that the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, first of all, had to apologise and, and then had the to apologise. And then went on to, to win the election. The Prime Minister then had to apologise and then resign. So they lost a lot of seats then. They've now lost but a thousand more. But they did win the election after that. And they've now lost a thousand more. And we are now the largest party in local government, the Labour Party. We know that we have to work hard to earn the trust of voters. But what I heard as I went up and down the country over the last few weeks was people talking about the things that matter to them being the cost of living crisis, being crime on their streets and not feeling safe to go out, feeling like they couldn't afford to get on the housing ladder, especially for young people, feeling they couldn't afford their rent. 700,000 people last month couldn't afford to pay their rent or mortgage. And and what I heard from the Conservatives in the last six weeks was not a word on the cost of living crisis or the potential that local authorities have to help with that. Now, Keir Starmer, this week, as soon as the local election results were done, got in the new Labour Council leaders on, on Tuesday and they have all pledged to come up with a cost of living price, uh, plan over the next 100 days. So if you are living in a, in a Labour Council, that's part of what you're going to get now, we would dearly love to be in government because there's so much more we could do to but tackle those problems. But general election projections by, by, by Sky News and BBC News, for example, have, have Labour as the largest party, but not with enough seats. And that to, we've to got to work hard. Government. We've got okay. to work hard. But I would All also right. say that we're confident of being able to make greater gains in Scotland and Wales and London, which were not factored okay. in. I remember terrible results in the local elections for the Tories in 1997. And, of course, that gave uh, a great impetus for Labour to come up with a big, bold plan, and that was great. But I think Labour's got a problem now, Thang, I mean, it's not the same. I think Labour on 35 points, I think it was 43 points in 97. So I think we're looking, the reality is we're looking at a hung parliament, and that means we're looking at Labour negotiating its way into a set of relationships to, make a, to, make a, to form a government. Who's that going to be with? How are you going to manage the collapse of the Labour to... vote in Scotland? That's a very interesting... Question. It is a very interesting question, but there's a large number of it? independents that stand in... Yes, I'm answering it now. So there's a large number of independents that stand in council elections who do not stand in national elections, first of all. That's a large number of people. No, no, but that's Second not what he's, he's, Richard's saying, if, if, you're not going to be the, if you're not going to have a majority, who are you going to get, get into bed with? Well, the voters hate it when we do deals. Uh, the voters prefer to vote. And we intend to fight for every vote. Do you hate it when parties do deals? Vote. <laughs> yes, OK. But can I have the question... They do. Are I'm, you going I'm, to be... Hang on, let, let, anticipating you... the result of a general okay. election is really insulting to the let, voters. Let, let Richard I discussions, hard for The that. discussions you're having at the Parliamentary Party, any series, are you thinking about something big and bold and exciting? Are you thinking about something it's... that's a bit more modest that's going to enable you to broaden that base of support? 
We, are, we want to transform our country because we know what potential it has. We know what amazing people we have. We know what resources we have. And we know what challenges we have ahead of us. We will also make sure that we are spending people's money wisely because it's their money okay. when they hand it over to us in taxes. And that is a difficult job to do, but we will work very yes. hard, very hard to convince the people that okay. they can trust us with their vote. And I hope that we're going to have a Labour majority government within a year. Nick. Right, well, as we've talked about uncontrolled immigration and swimming in um, sewage, we could probably all do with a bit of a laugh. Did you see yesterday that the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak refused to rule out forming a coalition government <laughs> at the next election? <laughs> Someone needs to tell him he has two hopes, Bob Hope and no hope. <laughs> but, but coming back to Labour, and I absolutely endorse what Richard said, that was only, if you look at someone such as Professor Sir John Curtis, who is, is with the BBC, is the guru of pollsters. They have not done enough to get over the line. And ask yourself this. Apart from confiscating your firstborn, the Conservatives couldn't do anything more to be hated. There's nothing more they could possibly do, and yet Labour can still only struggle to a nine-point lead. With the My biggest... point being... Hold on, That's hold enough. on. With respect. My point being that there is still time for the Conservatives. There is still time if they go for some Conservative policies, i.e. cutting the biggest tax take in 70 years, putting in business incentivising taxes as well, helping businessmen and women grow their businesses. There is still time for the Conservatives to actually, maybe the last five minutes of the game, to do something. So it is absolutely, as Richard said, it is far but one. And if you go back to Tony Blair's time, prior to their landscape, they were 20-plus points ahead. This crowd currently are just nine, and they need to think on that. OK. I, I wonder if I... Um, I'll come to you in a minute, of course. Given that, given that there was such a big show of hands of people who are undecided, do you put all your hands down again? I don't normally do this, I, I promise. Can, can, I'd like to hear from, from a couple of the undecideds. Yes, you're in the blue shirt there, yes. So you're undecided. What, what would sway you one way or the other? Well, I think we need to hear more from Labour on what they're actually going to do. It's all very well giving it the good talk, but I completely agree with Nick. Currently, Labour's biggest positive is just how bad the Tories are. No, well, yeah. that, that, that's, okay. It's very easy to knock them. I've, got, right, hang on, hang on. I've given you loads of time to talk, forgive me. I, I want to hear some to. more from... Yeah, but I need to hear some more from the audience as well. That's why they've all come. Yes, you there. I'm only undecided in the um, aspect of which one is most likely to depose the Conservative MP, because... At the moment, I don't see them... They haven't seemed to um, had that reality check. They still, with respect to what you were saying about your five points, to me, you're still the party that looks after their own with the people with the pigs in the trough, like with PPE and all that. I will vote for whoever I think will get you out, whether they're Lib Dem or Labour. Okay. So you'll vote tactically. Or That's green, what you're <laughs> I can see a hand at the very back, but I can't... No, further back, I'll come to you in a minute. Yes, I can't see who's raised it, though. I'm undecided. Oh, hang on, OK, and then I'll come to the woman at the back. I'm yes, let's hear from you who's undecided with the glasses I'm on. I'm undecided yeah. because whatever the parties say, we can't believe it, because they or cannot... Party. They cannot sort things in five years. We've talked about the water, we've talked about um, transport, we've talked about immigration. It's long-term. We need the parties working together. OK, and the person behind you, yes. Yeah, I kind of agree with what most people have said, to be honest. I don't hear any of you um, from Labour or Conservatives kind of talking a truth about now. It's all good and fine giving us what you'll do in 10 years, what you'll do in 20 years, but right now in Bexhill we've got real issues with stores closing down, rent is up, People can't afford to buy houses, and then you've got people moving in from London, making ha house prices go up. So what are you guys going to do for us now so that I, as an undecided voter, can be like, yeah, I'm going to vote Tory, or yeah, I'm going to vote Labour? OK, and then the man there in the glass, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yes, you. Um, I, I just am really concerned, really, as it's kind of a vote for ABT, anyone but Tory. I don't think that there's actually a consensus as to go for Labour. And it's almost a complete open goal for the Labour um, general election. It's an open goal. How can they miss it? But I kind of am worried about the fact that they might, because I don't understand their policies yet. OK, and the man over there with the glasses. Um, it's, it's kind of a bit of a strange kind of thing, because we're all talking about voting tactically and getting rid of parties that we don't want, not necessarily who we want. 
I think that it's now time to have a real serious discussion about proportional representation mm -hmm. and voting for a party we actually won. It's all, and, at the last general election, it took, on average, 38,000 votes to elect a Tory and 51,000 to elect a Labour, Labour candidate. That is not fair. That's not true democracy. It's not one vote is equal to another. OK. Ash. So, I mean, what, do you th what do you think of what you're hearing? I mean, I, I think that this reflects something which I've been thinking for quite a while, which is that neither major party seems to be living in the real world when it comes to the scale of the crises that people are facing, particularly if you want to look at the matter of housing. So if you're a renter, there are cities in this country, London, Glasgow, Manchester, Birmingham, um, Bristol, where rent is going up above the rate of inflation, the average rent for a new let. Is anybody proposing anything to protect renters yes. from above inflation rent increases? No, because you guys have, have, are saying that you're not going to do rent caps and people can't wait for you to build the council housing because they need to be protected from rents now. When it comes to interest rates, if you are one of those miraculous under 40s who's managed to get on the housing ladder, you're now paying through the eyeballs because those rates are being gouged. And nobody is turning around and saying, hey, you know what, we're going to deal with the fact that the Bank of England only has one tool to deal with inflation and it's punishing workers, it's trying to drive down wages, whereas actually the reason why the cost of things is going up is not because of wages, it's because of things like food and energy. I don't hear Labour saying that, I certainly don't hear the Tories saying that. And when it comes to the trustworthiness of politicians, I think people are sick of being lied to, they're sick of promises being made and not being kept. And unfortunately, rather than having a Labour leader with integrity saying, this is what I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to do it, and you can count on my word, he's abandoning every pledge he's ever made. And it's very rarely a good sign with a politician that they started breaking their promises before they even get into power. <laughs> OK. All right. Listen. I... I am going to lighten the mood. <laughs> Just for the last two and a half minutes or whatever we've got for the end of the program. <laughs> She's going, good lord. <laughs> this is, I'm going to ask you first. Oh, no, no. Right. Uh, Steve Nightingale. What, a, what an appropriate name, actually, as well. <laughs> Steve. Hi. Um, yeah, the UK's Eurovision entry is called I Wrote a Song. What song title would best capture how the country feels at present? All right. You're all going to have a few seconds to rack your brains. <coughs> Nick, go on. Uh, Swimming in the sewage. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I haven't heard that song, I don't know about you. Of course, the songmeister here, uh, Richard. I'm looking at the Smiths. Heaven knows I'm miserable now. <laughs> <laughs> I did one of your own songs is Breadline Britain. I wondered if you might say that, but maybe that's not how you're feeling right now. Don't leave me this way. <laughs> um, listen, any ideas from the audience? Obviously, great for research. I've made a whole list here, but no one wants to know what I think. Um, Ash? How am I supposed to follow yeah. that? I know, I know. I was just going to say, if you're going from, you know, I've written a song, mine would be, I've taken up drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yes, you in there in the glass, what would you say? Forest started the fire. Forest <laughs> started the fire. Yes, woman there in the, in the, in the middle, so I'm asking you to move very fast. Yes? Help. <laughs> um, up. Well, as we come into an election, for me, it's got to be the Bucks Fizz um, winning track, making your mind up. <laughs> for me, times are tough, but the future is better. <laughs> Man there with the beard at the back of the glasses. Living on a thin line. Living on a thin line. Yes, uh, man there in the colourful shirt. Ghost Town by the specials. Ghost Town by the specials. <laughs> the guy just behind you, yeah? Always look on the bright side of life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. So what did I have? I had always look on the bright side of life. Um, I will survive. <laughs> Black Gloria Gaynor. The winner takes it all. We wanted about losing my religion, Richard, but we thought that probably wasn't... You know, <laughs> we can talk. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah. OK, anyone else know that's all the takers for Eurovision? OK, well, good luck to, to the UK, I have to say, this weekend. Oh, that's it from us. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much for watching from our panel. Thank you for coming on this evening. From all of you from Bexton on Sea, it was great to hear what you had to say. Thank you so much for coming along. And thank you very much to you at home for watching. And remember, of course, we're on social media and available after the programme in a podcast on BBC Sounds. From Question Time in Bexton on Sea. Until next week, bye-bye.